I'm going to read from Psalm 119, verses 89 through 100. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Thy faithfulness is unto all generations. Thou hast established the earth and it abideth. They continue this day according to thine ordinances, for all are thy servants. Unless thy law had been my delights, I should then have perished in my affliction. I will never forget thy precepts, for with them thou hast quickened me. I am thine, save me, for I have sought thy precepts. The wicked have waited for me to destroy me, but I will consider thy testimonies. I have seen an end of all perfection, but thy commandment is exceeding broad. Oh, how I like thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Thou, through thy commandments, hast made me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients because I keep thy precepts. I have restrained my feet from every evil way that I might keep thy word. I have not departed from thy judgments, for thou hast taught me. How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. As we sat together today, I uh, I think back to a period of time uh, when in the old Presbyterian church there was a, a great deal of, of apostasy taking place, and it, it was a sad, sad thing when, as I mentioned last week, that there was a period of time in China, it looked like when I saw the list of, of missionaries in China, uh, you know, many, many years ago before the, the communists took over, there was like a thousand missionaries and uh, who were diligent. And uh, we started thankful for that. And uh, and there, there was a period of time, and unfortunately, a prophecy came into the, uh, that Presbyterian group. Apostasy came into there. People uh, departed from the faith and, and uh, walked in a, a different course and, and didn't follow the word of God. And uh, so uh, you can read in Dr. Major's book, Christianity and Liberalism, it's a series of lectures that he gave in, in 1929 uh, concerning uh, doctrinal matters, but especially uh, looking at various themes in each one of the chapters. And he would talk about what liberalism teaches and what, what the Bible teaches. And, uh, and that makes me think, of, and I, I rejoice in this heritage that this church has. I remember uh, the people who had started it were telling me when, when we came here that, uh, and they chose the name of the church, First Bible Presbyterian Church. And, and people would ask them, well, what's the difference between uh, your church and, and First Presbyterian on Main Street? See, we had the Bible in it. We had the Bible in it. And so they reflected that in the name that was given for the church. And we, we do rejoice in that. I mentioned to you last week when one of our members kind of said to the pastor there, he asked her what she thought of his uh, funeral message. She said it had been all right. He just had the gospel. And, uh, and there wasn't. And uh, so we need to be faithful. And uh, Dr. Machen had these series of lectures that he gave on Christianity and liberalism. And he said, uh, modern liberalism has been observed so far has lost sight of the two great presuppositions of the Christian message, the living God and the fact of sin, the liberal doctrine of God and the liberal doctrine of man 
are both diametrically opposite to the Christian view. But the divergence concerns not only the presuppositions of the message, but also the message itself. The Christian message has come to us through the Bible. What shall we think about this book of which the message is contained? According to the Christian view, the Bible contains an account of a revelation from God to man, which is found nowhere else. It's true, the Bible also contains a confirmation and a wonderful enrichment of the revelations which are given us, of which are given also by the things that God has made and by the conscience of man. And a, an example of that is the scripture that shows the testimony that's given from the things that are made. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. And just think about that for a moment. You know, throughout the world, there's that testimony <coughs> that the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. I was thinking it's uh, been amazing. In that new telescope they have now, uh, it's taking more uh, pictures of way out space. And, and I forgot what the name of one that had been, you know, so miraculous, amazing to see the pictures. Mm -hmm. But they come back with stunning uh, testimonies of the Creator God. And, uh, uh, and we rejoice. They probably haven't said that, but anyway, uh, we we look at those pictures and we think about God's creation, uh, uh, where it says here, "The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork." These words are a confirmation of the revelation of God in nature, and where it, what it what it says, "All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God." These words are a confirmation of what is attested by the conscience. But in addition to such reaffirmations of what might conceivably be learned elsewhere, as a matter of fact, because of men's blindness, even so much is learned elsewhere only in comparatively obscure fashion. The Bible also contains an account of a revelation which is absolutely new. That new revelation concerns the way by which sinful man can come into communion with the living God, that is, the gospel message. The way was opened according to the Bible by an act of God when almost 1,900 years ago, outside the walls of Jerusalem, the eternal Son was offered as a sacrifice for the sins of men. To that one great event, the whole Old Testament looks forward. And in that one event, the whole of the New Testament finds its center and core. Salvation, then, according to the Bible, is not something that was discovered, but something that happened. Hence appears the uniqueness of the Bible. All the ideas of Christianity might be discovered in some other religion, yet there would be in that other religion no Christianity. For Christianity depends not upon the complex of ideas, but upon the narration of an event. That is, the, the account of the life and times of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. As we think about what we have in our hands, and as we talked last week, we especially have focused on verse 89, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. And we think of some of the things that are told us in the scriptures. In uh, Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles, Chapter 32 in verse 7. Second Chronicles 32 in verse 7. Be strong and courageous, be not afraid nor dismayed for the king of Assyria, nor for all the multitude that is with him. For there be more with us than with him. And this revealed in scripture. And we think of that not only in the time of the Old Testament when this was written. But even in our day and time that we can have that confidence that's spoken of there in Isaiah uh, chapter 35. Isaiah chapter 35 and verse 7. And there we read. And the parched ground shall become and the parched ground shall become a pool and thirsty land, springs of water and the habitation of dragons for each leg shall be grass 
with weeds and rushes. And a highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those that the way of fearing men, no fool shall not err therein. No lion, lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go up there. <laughs> it shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And what a promise that is, even in the midst of that. The, but the redeemed, God in his sovereignty and his rule, it will walk there. And then in verse 10, and the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sun shall flee away. And what a wonderful promise. And scattered throughout the scriptures are places of this. Let me read in, in Joshua chapter 1. <laughs> Joshua chapter 1. And verse 7, uh, 7. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, Thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest, and we're exhorted to follow in God's holy and infallible word in a number of places, both in the Old and the New Testament. And uh, we're encouraged towards uh, rather than being cowardly, but to be strong. In Revelation 21, verse 8, Revelation 21. In verse 8, there we read, But the fearful and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So it speaks of it in the scripture, and uh, we certainly rejoice in the Salvation that's spoken of and by which we come to everlasting life. And, and that the Lord will certainly bless in that. In Matthew chapter 11, Matthew chapter 11, verse 12. And there we read, and from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. And in a number of other places we can read, but all pointing towards the, the great struggles and the great fights that are taking place over the things of God's holy and fallible word. And, uh, and we need to be faithful to God's word. But as we talked about it last week, we talked about wherever the Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. We look at verses in Psalm 119 and in verse 152. Psalm 119, verse 152. Concerning thy testimonies, I have known of old that thou hast founded them forever. And then in, in Psalm 160. Thy word is true from the beginning. Every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. And many other places we can look. In Psalm 27, Psalm 27, and verse 11, right here. Psalm 27, verses 11 through 14. Teach me thy way, O Lord, lead me in a plain path, cause my enemies. Deliver me not over unto the will of my enemies. For false witnesses are rising up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty. I have fainted, unless I have believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. And may those be words that we 
teeth in our life and demonstrated in their actions to wait on the Lord and to be of good courage and with the promise that he shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. And many other places we can look. But we're certainly thankful for these things that are mentioned here. We go on and, and look at the section that begins at verse 93 in Psalm 119. I will never forget thy precepts, for with them thou hast quickened me. I am thine, save me, for I have sought thy precepts. The wicked have waited for me to destroy me, but I will consider thy testimonies. I have seen an end of all perfection, but thy commandment is exceedingly broad. In this psalm, in this section of Psalm 119, the psalmist certainly shows his thankfulness for the promises of God. He engages his heart uh, to faith and obedience to the word of God and his being faithful to that and by dedication of himself to God as a servant. And uh, as we read there in verse 94, I am thine, save me, for I have sought my precepts. And he addresses the one uh, by the way of whom he has salvation and God having chosen us in Christ before the foundation of the world. And then we also see the commendation of the word above all things in, in Psalm 9, uh, 119 verse 96. I have seen an end of all perfection, but thy commandment is exceeding broad. And so we stand in that broad way and that we would be faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, that we would have the love for God's word. The believer, the person who's come to salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ, he's the Lord's peculiar servant, particular servant, bound to him by the bonds of creation, bound to him by the bonds of redemption, bound to him by the prompt covenant promises, God's holy infallible word as one man wrote it is his duty thankfully to reckon uh, on his interest and right in God and God's interest in him for his own encouragement and for people's praise and to say I am thine I am thine and there in verse 94 where it has that I am thine save me for I have sought thy precepts and we rejoice in that promise even in, in Day of great wickedness and and uh, and malcontent, and then a day in which there are many untruthful things spoken by those who are in power. And uh, we also recognize here, though, the things that God uses, that uh, things that are visible, temporal, uh, and we recognize that. But what we say, but the benefit of the Scripture is everlasting. It's not, it's not temporary, it's not fleeting, it's not, uh, it doesn't contradict itself, God's holy and infallible word, and we stand uh, with that word of God, which is a sword, and sharper than two-edged sword, and we see there that the use of all things is visible, it's temporal, but the benefit of the scripture, as we said, is everlasting. Uh, a man may satisfy himself, in the uh, contemplation of the word and virtue of anything which is visible in this world. But the deep wisdom of God in the scriptures is unsearchable. The perfection of the scripture is above all comparison. I have seen an end of all perfection, but thy commandment is exceeding broad. In verse 97, oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. We were just uh, noting some of that in uh, Sunday school today when we were talking about the people who refer to themselves as being they're New Testament Christians and uh, they don't have anything to do with the Old Testament. God's word is exceeding broad, as it says here. And thy testimonies are my meditation. May they be our meditation too. And uh, what he says in in verse 
100. I understand more than the ancients because I keep thy precepts. Whether it's Old Testament or New Testament, but the same to Ted. And, the, and the, another reason for commending the Word of God is because it's able to make a man more wise than old age. And long experience of the affairs of men in the world can do. We learn that old age and experience uh, have certain things in common. And, uh, but as it says here, that God's special wisdom by the word uh, must be in our lives as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. I have more understanding than the ancients. As we read in Psalm uh, 119, verse 100. I understand more than the ancients because I keep thy precepts. You know, that's, that's a neat word to describe people that are older. Ancients. Maybe we ought not do that. Maybe it's different. And so, and uh, and then when he says in, in Psalm 101, I have refrained my feet from every evil way that I might keep thy word. And the reason for David's uh, commendation of the scripture, which is also an evidence of his respect for it, is because for the love of understanding and keeping it, He's abandoned those sins in his life and, and has walked in the, in the ways of the Lord. And it's, uh, he certainly did uh, wander. There, there were particular times in his life, but for the end of his life, he was certainly faithful in God's word. And in, in verse 102, I have not departed from thy judgments, for thou hast taught me. And this is the sixth reason for commending the, the word of God. Is because he was enabled to overcome those difficulties which lay ahead, which tended to cause him to depart from the matter of obedience. And so we rejoice that we have that God's word. And then a, a description of God's word in verse 103 How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. This is the seventh reason why David uh, commends the scripture. It's because of the sweetness in the scriptures. And we learn here, there's a delight uh, to be found in hearing. There's a delight to be found in the reading. There's a delight to be found in the speaking of God's word. And there's a delight to be found in meditating upon God's holy and infallible word. And as one man wrote, yet the believer alone and discern it. How sweet are thy words to my taste. Scriptural pleasure far um, outnumbers or outweighs any sweetness that the, the world may give us, but the, the spiritual pleasure that we have through God's holy and fallible word, we rejoice in that. And he says in Psalm 104, as we're still continuing to look at his uh, being faithful to God's word. Through thy precepts I get understanding. Therefore I hate every false way. And uh, pretty, pretty bold, pretty brash, pretty strong. And so he says, I hate every false way. And this is the eighth reason uh, that's listed here in commending God's holy and foul word is because he's made wise uh, to the holiness of God's word. He's made wise to the teaching of God's word, and he's made to hate all sin uh, because of it. And so he's faithful to that. And hate's not necessarily a bad thing in regard to those things that are so, so unbiblical. And, uh, but anyway, this is what he says. And, uh, and, and then, as he mentioned, through thy precepts I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. When we look at this, we think of the verse 105. Thy word is a lamp of my feet, and a light of my path. In the previous section, the psalmist uh, gave evidences of his love and respect for the word of God. And uh, first is his resolution to make it his life, to direct him in all his actions, in all his affairs of life. 
thy word is a lamp to my feet. We think about the light of scripture. It's not only to give him man, man general rules for ordering his life, but also direct his actions that he makes in this life. So, as I said, he hates every false way, and uh, and their the words are a light unto, unto my feet. I have sworn, and I will perform it. I will keep thy righteous judgments. I am afflicted very much. Quicken me, O Lord, according unto thy word. Once again, it's still God's word. And then he said, in verse 106, going back to what that said, I have sworn that I will perform it, that I will keep thy righteous judgments. And this is another evidence of David's purpose to conform his life to the rule of God's word, tying himself to it. The uh, upright man is willing to be bound by the things of God's word. He's willing to be bound by obedience to God's holy and infallible word. And he's willing to speak of God's word. And he said, I have sworn and will perform it, that I will keep thy righteous judgment. And certainly uh, encouragement to us in our lives as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said in verse 107, I'm afflicted very much, quicken me, O Lord, according unto thy word. And this no verse has a verse has a verse of how God's word uh, directs the psalmist and in the way he should go and the way he should walk. And certainly it should direct us in our paths too. And this is a, another evidence of David's purpose to make use of God's word. It says, seeking nothing for his comfort, even in the greatest affliction, and uh, except the quickening of the spiritual life in him by the word of God. That's, that's what we would desire, a strengthening of our spiritual life uh, from the word of God. Uh, and as we have mentioned before uh, today, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. So it would direct our ways. It would be faithful to God's word. We would make use of God's word and seeking nothing else for our comfort and encouragement in the greatest affliction, as he said, except the quickening of spiritual life in itself by the word. May it be that we would desire to walk in God's path. And, uh, and you know, we can, and, and we probably will spend a uh, long time because we're going through Psalm 119 uh, on Wednesday night. And sometimes we get three or four words like that, or, or, but never more than one verse, you know, and, uh, in discussing that. But it's a thorough discussion. But looking at the psalmist, Psalm 119, all about God's word. And it's something that ought to encourage us. Certainly something that's an exhortation to us to walk in the ways of the Lord. And uh, when affliction comes, faith takes us to God when affliction comes. And as he says in this passage, I am afflicted very much. Quicken me, O Lord, according to thy word. When God's pleased to take the word of a promise lively, as one man wrote, or to perform what the promise allowed us to expect, such a consolation is a sufficient and the, the heaviest affliction. And the heaviest affliction we may face, may we resort to God's word. May we find comfort therein. And may the Lord bless us as we would seek his will, following his way according to God's word. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Our Father, we're thankful for your word. Our Father, we're thankful that your word uh, uh, lasts forever. We're thankful that your word is strength to our hearts, strength to our souls, and a, and a guide on, for the path on which we should walk. Our Father, may we be faithful to it. May we lift it up. May we bear witness to the sick and dying and spiritually 
bereaved world and uh, that we would see people come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray that each of us would be strengthened in our lives by your holy and valuable word. For it's in God's name we pray. Amen. Let's turn to hymn number uh, 175. 175. Let's all stand.